giving da'wah to atheists is a lot easier than most people actually think. A lot of people put atheists kind of like on a pedestal because, you know, a lot of the times they, they're more scientific, right? So they know a lot of science. Um, or because, you know, they're just better at debating and argumentation. Whatever the case might be, most atheists that I've actually met actually have some major inconsistencies in their mental framework. And I've never seen anyone who's presented a question that Islamic theologians have not already answered thousands and thousands of years ago. Right? So I want to sit here and kind of address most of these points. I mean, obviously you can't address all of them. But most of the different types of things that you will see with atheism is just so that you can be more prepared when you do da'wah to them. So the first thing to acknowledge is that you're actually going to meet very different types of atheists and agnostics. Right? And so the first type of atheist that you're actually going to meet is, and this is in no particular order, uh, is the indifferent atheist. Right? So this is not an atheist who actually cares about religion. Uh, they say, I don't know and I don't care. I don't know if there's a God, I don't care if there's a God. So I once met a guy like this, uh, and you know, we started speaking. I said, uh, what's your kind of religious background? He's like, I don't really ha believe in a religion, and I don't necessarily care to either. Right? And I said, I completely understand your viewpoint. Right? Uh, because you know, a lot of people are looking away from organized religion. They think it's like kind of controlling and things like that. But I have a kind of different perspective. Is it okay if I share that with you? And he's like, yeah, sure. So I said, look, religion and God, they kind of have a set definition right, within society. And then they have a more functional definition. Right? And the functional definition of God is not like some man in the sky. It's not some dude who uh, just throws lightning bolts from the heavens. Right? The functional definition of God is the one who decides right from wrong for you. Right? The one who decides what you can do, what you cannot do. And this to me is a more useful definition. Because the definition of God that says that He's just a, a guy, you know, people declare their gods all the time. Some people say they, they believe in Jesus. Some people say they believe in Allah. Some people say they believe in Vishnu. But then they live their lives in a completely separate way. Right? And so what I'm talking about is the God that actually dictates how you live your life the highest authority in your chain of authority. And religion is then the subsequent set of practices that you develop because of those set of values. Right? And so when you think about it like this, when you think about the role of God, right, that is actually one of the most important questions in your life. Who is playing the role of God for you? Who decides what's right and wrong for you? Who decides what's good and bad for you? Who decides what you do and what you don't do? Right? That's, that's literally everything. Everything that you should care about is in that one question. Who is your God? So would you not agree then that based on that definition that this is something that's really important and it should be discussed? He was like, you know, yeah, I guess so, right? So I said, who do you take to be your authority? Right? How do you make decisions about right and wrong? And, uh, you know, a lot of times people don't really know because they just kind of consume these with, uh, you know, just through osmosis, right? And so he was like, you know, probably like society and whatever I think is best. So I said, the way I see it is that every single person who's going to fill this role of God is completely and totally deficient uh, for one of two reasons. Number one, let's say I take my own intellect or my own desires as my God. Are there not people who follow their desires and end up as drug addicts or follow their intellect and end up, you know, you know, just screwing themselves over in jail and stuff like that, right? And, you know, it, you can misguide yourself, right? And the reason is because we are ignorant. We don't necessarily always know what is best for us. We try very hard to make a good decision, but we don't always know. On the other hand, there's also people trying to play that role of God for you who are insincere which is an even worse problem, right? So like politicians or like uh, uh, celebrities, people who just want your money or your vote or your, uh, your love and, and uh, adoration, right? They don't necessarily care about your personal well-being. They really care about what you can provide for them. So every single God, if you really look at them, they're either one of these two things. They're either ignorant or they're insincere. The only one who really fits the criteria that they're neither ignorant nor insincere would be the one who created you. Because the one who created you 
obviously he knows everything about you. You know, he created the universe around you, so he knows everything about that too. Uh, someone who created you definitely doesn't need you for anything, right? So if they tell you to do something, it's not because they need you to do that thing. It's because it's good for you, right? So if such a creator exists, now this would be a creator that's worthy of worship, right? Wouldn't you agree? And, you know, a lot of times people see the logic there and they say, yeah, I would agree with that. But I don't know that the a creator exists. So how do we actually go about proving the creator? And this gets to the second type of atheist, which is the one who wants evidence, right? The one who wants evidence for God. Now, what we have to realize first is, of course, we have evidence for Allah. You know, and there's nothing in Islam that's based off of just like irrationality. We have evidence for, for Allah. Uh, but the thing you have to realize is not every person asking for evidence actually wants it, right? So you do have to gauge sincerity just a little bit uh, before answering this. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, Allah knows what's in their hearts. We present the evidence. They take it or they don't take it. That's completely up to them. The simplest evidence that I prefer is the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an kind of skips a bunch of steps, right? The Qur'an teaches about God and it teaches about the Prophet Muhammad wasallam all at once, Right? So if someone acknowledges that the Qur'an is a miraculous book, then he must, by definition, acknowledge that Islam is a true religion. Right? And there are hundreds of evidences that you can use from Qur'an, but one thing I will warn against is don't use evidences that you see on TikTok. A lot of them are like misrepresentative or misrepresented, or they're not completely accurate. Right? Like Some of the numerological uh, evidences, for example... Um, if you really scrutinize them, they're not like 100%, right? So like, okay, if it increases your iman, it increases your iman. But like, don't present something that would be flimsy, right? Because you're hurting your case. Uh, there's plenty of clear evidences and clear ayat that you can use uh, that are beneficial, right? So I personally prefer the scientific uh, statements of the Qur'an because they're very clear. Uh, and they're very miraculous in, as well, right? So for example, uh, there's an ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, مَوْجُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِهَا مَوْجُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِهَا سَحَاب That there's waves, over them are waves, over them is the sky, right? So talking about the ocean. So, you know, I can ask to, you know, some of my atheist friends, I'm like, okay, were you aware that there exist subsurface waves in the ocean? Like be below the, the surface of the ocean, there are waves, and actually a lot of them won't even know this, right? Because this is not something that's well known to everybody. So at that point, if they say no, I'll just be like, look, you are unaware of something. Despite being in the age of information, despite having the internet, despite being, having all of these facilities at your hand, you don't know this fact about the ocean having waves below its surface. And yet the Qur'an is talking about waves being below the surface of the ocean. 1400 years ago, when people couldn't even reach that depth, you know, with like free diving. So, what is the explanation for this statement existing in the Qur'an? Right? You know, and this is just kind of to get people curious. I want people to get curious about the Qur'an and I want them to read it. Because the Qur'an does a very good job of explaining itself. So, this is like one example. You know, another example we could say, you know, uh, that Allah SWT says, we will seize him by his lying forehead. That he calls the forehead lying. That uh, the part of the brain that's actually active during lying is the prefrontal cortex, right? Right behind the forehead. So that's another example, right? Or the very clear example where it says, we're the ones who created the heavens and we're the ones expanding them. Okay, expansion of the universe is what? 1950s? You know, this is like a 1400 year old declar declaration, right? So how can such statements about the natural world exist in a book that's not a science book? It's not like someone's claiming to do evidence and uh, experiments and all these things, right? These are just statements, matter of fact, about the world. And one thing that I really love, that I've just discovered recently, as an evidence for Qur'an, is uh, uh, that Allah SWT says that the heavens and earth were made in six days. And He says in another place that the earth was created in two days. And if you actually look at the scientific estimates for the dates of the, or the ages of the universe and the earth, Universe is estimated at about 13.7 billion years old. Uh, Earth is estimated at about 4.5 billion years old. You do the math, the Earth is almost precisely one-third the age of the universe. 
And Allah subhanahu wa describes it as being made in two days. The universe was made in six days. So it's about one third of that number, right? Which is just uh, astounding, right? Just mind boggling. But, anyways, th- there's hundreds of these, right? You could use a hadith about um, the, the tall buildings, right? Uh, about in, make, you know, give the example of Dubai or about how Arabia will become green again, right? Another uh, prediction from the hadith. So all of these things are evidences for Islam. The second evidence that you could present is an evidence known as kalam, which is mentioned in the books of Aqidah. Right? And the statements of kalam are very simple and straightforward and easy to understand just from a logical perspective. The argument can basically be summarized as follows. There are three things in existence, right? or, or we can divide the existence into three. We have Allah who is the creator. So these are just definitions now, right? We have everything else, which is the universe. So this would include like a multiverse if it exists, right? But everything other than the creator is the universe, is how we're going to define it. And then there's nothing. So that's really all there is. So we know about at least the universe. We know that that's something that exists. And we need to understand how can it exist. Has it always existed or did it begin to exist? And so the example that's given here is, you know, imagine for one second that uh, there's a wall in front of you. And I say that the wall is 10 steps away. Now, if you take 10 steps, you will reach the wall, is what that means. But if I say that the distance between you and this wall is infinite, then that means that no matter how many steps you take, there will always be more steps between you and the wall. You can never traverse that amount. What that means is that if the past was infinite, or if the universe has existed forever, we could never reach the beginning. If we had like a time machine, and you press the button, and you go back a billion years every time, and you count that as one step, right? It's the same as the wall, right? That no matter how many steps you take, no matter how many times you press that button, you're never going to reach that wall. You're never going to reach the beginning of time, because there is no beginning. It's endless. Well then, how did time reach us? If we cannot reach it, how did it reach us? Right? <laughs> because it had to have reached us for us to exist. The past has to come to an end for the present to start to begin. If the past is endless, then it doesn't end. So we wouldn't exist. Which means that the universe has a beginning. right? And so now we ask ourselves, what is the cause of that beginning? And by the way, science supports this as well. There's no evidence for the universe being any older than 13.7 billion years old. Everything else is just speculation, right? Um, so how did it begun, begin to exist, right? Because that first moment is different from every other moment. Uh, every other moment could just rely on the previous moment, right? But the first moment has nothing to rely on. So Allah SWT says in the Qur'an, أَمْ خُلِقُوا مِنْ غَيْرِ شَيْءٍ أَمْ هُمُ الْخَالِقُونَ were they created from nothing at all, or were they the creators? Or did they create the heaven and the earth? Rather, they are uncertain. So first of all, if nothing becomes something, then there's really no point of science or anything like that, right? Because at any moment, you know, you could be walking down the street, a universe pops up out of nowhere, right? And this, things don't have to have rhyme or reason, right? It, it defies human logic and intellect that nothing could produce something. Because nothing... And if someone doesn't understand this, right, if you're explaining this and someone doesn't understand it, understand, like, explain to them that nothing has no power, no properties, no intellect, no abilities, no matter, no space, no time, no continuum, no nothing. Nothing is literally the absence of everything, right? So it, by, it has no ability by definition, so it can't do anything. Okay? So that, that you could throw that out the window. Number two, the universe creating itself is also an absurdity, right? That, you know... Because you have to exist before yourself to make yourself. So it's like a mother giving birth to herself. It's just, it's just bizarre, right? I mean, it just can't happen. Right? So this circular idea that the universe creates itself is, is refuted as well. What you are left with is it cannot be nothing, it cannot be the universe, and there's only one other thing that, that's left in our definition, which is the Creator. And so now you have to acknowledge that there is a creator that is different from his creation. The creator is independent. The creation is dependent. The creation changes. The creator does not change. Because if the creator changed, then we would say, how did he come to change? 
something else must have changed him, right? So uh, there's some that goes against the fact that he's independent, right? And so we start to kind of develop these attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm going to leave a short document that I've written um, in the comments or in the description so that if you want to read more about this, you can read more. But basically that's the kalam argument in a nutshell, right? That there must be a creator and the creator is different from his creation. So now atheists, what they'll come back with usually is they'll say that, well, you, in the beginning you said that the, the universe cannot be infinite because then because it requires a beginning. But you're saying that God doesn't require a beginning, that He is infinite. right? And the response to this is that the nature is completely different. That the universe's nature is dependent and changing and material. Whereas the nature of God is neither of, neither of those things. He doesn't change. He doesn't age. Right? He doesn't, uh, he doesn't depend on anything. He's very self-sufficient. He's existed in eternity. Right? That's the only really rational explanation. And this is why Allah is known as the necessary existence. So, you will also find now, so these are some of the evidences for Allah, but there's other categories of atheists as well. And so I want to talk about at least one more, and that is the perennial atheist. Right? The one who says, and these are typically just good people who just want to be friends with everyone. And they say like, everyone is right, nobody's wrong. Right? Everybody's right, nobody's wrong, to each their own, you know, kumbaya, blah, blah, blah. Right? Uh, <laughs> aside from the fact that this is blatantly false, like it, it just cannot be true, uh, we have to understand where they're coming from. Right? Uh, everything has the same source and essence, right? That Allah only ever revealed one religion. And those religions then mutated into the religions that we have today. Whereas Islam did not mutate. Islam remained exactly what it was, right? So this is the only difference between Islam and those other traditions. So obviously, it has the same essence, right? You know, to become a good person, to perfect your character and things like that. And it has the same destination, right? Which is to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at an intimate level, right, to become basically unified with Allah, right, as, as the Muslims will be in Jannah, right, will be unified with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the other religions say this as well, like nirvana, enlightenment, uh, in just different ways, right. So their source was one, their essence is one, but their methodology is different. And the fallacy here is that all paths lead to the same source, and the reality is that that's not true, right, that if there is such a thing as true spirituality, there must also be a thing as sp false spirituality, right? If there is such a thing as true guidance, then there must be something as false guidance as well, right? That if God wants us to worship Him alone, then by default, He doesn't want us to worship Him with partners, right? You have to make that distinction, right? And so, the path is important. And that path that was chosen for us is Islam. And the example that I give here is that you know, say that you have, uh, that you're married, you know, and you want to do something good for your wife. Uh, so you make her brec breakfast in bed. And then, but all the food you made was all the food that she doesn't like to eat. Well, now all of a sudden, your act of kindness and, and goodness has become something that's like annoying, right? Because why don't you know me better? Even though it's a thought that counts, right? Your wife wants you to uh, know about her. Right? So if someone is saying that, you know, all of us, we just love God, we just love being good, you know, we're all just trying to be the best people possible, well, then uh, the, the question then we have to answer is, what is the methodology that God loves best? Isn't that the best methodology? And that requires us to, to be a little bit more proactive. The other thing you can say is that, you know, it's not really fair to stereotype religions, right? <laughs> like, uh, people do that all the time. They just say, oh, they're all the same, you know? They're, no, they're not all the same, right? Everything has its different practices. It has different, uh, leads to different places and things like that. Now, the last type of atheist that I'll actually discuss here is the unreasonable atheist, right? These are people who have internal inconsistencies in the way they appreciate the world. And uh, they have unfair standards when it comes to Allah, right? So, for example, some people will say, okay, you gave me like logical evidence, but maybe logic doesn't apply, when it comes to the beginning of the universe, right? Or you gave me um, 
scriptural evidence, but you know, maybe it was just a coincidence. I want something that I can touch, feel, smell, experiment on. That would be considered evidence. Like I want God to show up in the sky for me. That's, the, that's what I would consider evidence. Now these people in truth, they just don't want to believe. Like honestly, they don't want to believe or they don't realize that they're being inconsistent, right? Because logic works for every single part of our lives, right? Like how can we even articulate a statement without using logic first, right? We first have to process it with our logical brains to come up with any conclusion. Science is based on logic. The way we would process our evidence would be based on logic. So to deny logic using logic is just the definition of ridiculous, right? So you have to like, we have to point that out. Like, okay, how can you say logic won't apply? That means that you can't trust anything at all. You know, you should just not even bother researching the world because you're doing that with logic and maybe logic doesn't apply. Then the second thing people say is that I want like empirical evidence. I want something that I can touch, feel, or experiment with. Now that is something that is beyond foolish, right? Because empirical evidence can never lead to certainty. It can lead to near certainty, but not certainty. So for example, and this is a ridiculous example, but if I have a tennis ball and I drop it and it falls down and I drop it again and it does the same thing and I do this like a thousand times, I get the same result a thousand times. Then I do it a million times, it gets the same result a million times. I can predict that the next time I do that, it's going to do the same thing. But I can't be like 100% sure that it's not going to become a butterfly and fly away, right? Like, how can I be sure that the universe doesn't have like some giant switch somewhere that just changes all the rules that, you know, fires every 100 million years or something like that, right? And tomorrow is just that day where falling balls turn into butterflies. Now, it's a, it's a ridiculous example, but it's just to prove the point that uh, at the end of the day, empirical evidence or scientific proof can only give us a near accurate prediction of what's to come. It can never give us a certain prediction of what's to come. Whereas logic can do that. If I say that there is no square circle on Jupiter, you don't need any evidence or experimentation to believe this. Why? Because a square circle is a logical impossibility. So if logic can prove that God exists, then this is more powerful than empirical proofs. And then the last thing that people say is like, I want to see God. And the thing that I respond to this is that uh, the ayah of the Qur'an. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if they saw God, they would say, we've been bewitched, or we're seeing a hallucination, or we've gone mad. Something like that, right? That before they believed in what they're seeing, because they say seeing is believing, right? Before they believe in what they're seeing, which is Allah, they would lie against their own eyes and their mind. They would say that my mind and my eyes are bad, but God cannot exist. <laughs> so, for such a person, and, and I've actually had atheists say this to me, like directly. Like I asked them that question, that's exactly what they said. Right? And so at that point, it's like, you don't want to believe. Right? Uh, and you're just not sincere. And if you were sincere, then I would recommend to you to experience for yourself. Call out to God and ask God to guide you to the truth that He has chosen for you. If He doesn't exist, nothing happens. If He exists, why wouldn't He guide you? And if He exists and He didn't guide you, then you have an excuse that you say, I asked you, you didn't show me the way. And so a lot of people would be like, well, I've actually said that before. I'm like, well, now we're having this conversation. Do you not see this as a sign? You know, like, <laughs> so this is like, uh, these are some of the inconsistencies with atheists. These are like some of their main arguments. I guess one final one would be the uh, problem of evil. I've refuted it like multiple times. But you know, you can check this video out if you want to find a refutation to that argument. So I'll make some arguments uh, for uh, Christianity and stuff as well. But uh, I'm getting kind of tired. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.